Good evening. Welcome to Pastoral Pondering. I'm Pastor Tim Hackett from Fairview Fruitville Baptist Church. It's good to be able to talk to you again tonight, and I pray and hope that you've had a good week thus far. And my prayers are for you and your family and your friends and relatives and your personal relationship with God and knowing that God is able to not only save you, but he's able to help you through difficult times, some of the times that we're going through right now. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 says, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. So you want to quit church. As a pastor down through the years, the many years I've been in the ministry, I've heard people tell me that they just want to quit church, and there's no reason why they can't. And they give me all kinds of excuses. I mean, is it okay just to quit going to church? I mean, it is, isn't it? And what is wrong with me just quitting church? And they'll say, look, pastor, I, I've had enough of the hypocrisy. People talk one way and they walk another way. I'm tired of not sensing the power of God and the moving of the Holy Spirit. I'm tired of Christians not responding to the Word of God. I'm tired of people coming to church and, and not worshiping, just sitting there like, a, like they're bored and unmoved by the Spirit. It seems like no one seems to really be concerned about the things of God. Do you know when was the last time a church member at your church or any church even talked about the things of God enthusiastically? Do you know when was the last time I heard someone testify about the power of God in their lives? Do you know when it was the last time that I felt God moving in our church? I'm tired of everything going like nothing is important or nothing is eternal. I'm tired of the urgency, the lack thereof for lost souls in our community and our own family. I'm tired of people being so concerned about health issues than they are about souls being saved. Now let me insert this so you won't misunderstand me. 90 plus percent of all requests at a prayer meeting is for sick folks. But there's a world around us, friends and relatives and loved ones, neighbors that are lost without Jesus Christ. And we are praying more about sick folks, sick folks than we are about sin sick folks. I'm tired of people literally no longer hearing God cry or hearing people cry out to God. I'm tired of not seeing souls being saved or the altars being filled. I mean, people come to church and, and you know the message is urgent and the message is needed. And why don't Christians respond? If God is alive, why don't they respond? Why don't they cry out to him? Why don't they act like he's a God? If church is so real, if it's so important. I mean, are we just playing games? Are we, do we really go to church to worship God? Is God really real? And what happens to the excitement that ought to be in church? So why can't I quit the church? So let me give you some reasons tonight that I've heard down through the years about why it's all right to quit church. And so I want to get into, again, their minds and talk about it as if I'm them. First of all, isn't God dead? I mean, God's dead, isn't he? I mean, okay, from what I see in church folks, they literally act like God is dead. They seem like there's nothing to have an intimate and personal relationship with God. If God is alive, why don't we see change in so many churches or church people or church members or Christians in their lives? Am I wrong feeling this way? I mean, I look around my church, and you know what? You would think you're attending a funeral. I don't really see people who truly seem to be excited about their relationship with God. I'm concerned about being in church. seems like we're just going through the emotions. There's no power. There's no response to the message. And when the song director leads a song, it seems like no one in the church are even singing a song like they're singing to a living God, but act like there's no God to worship. And they seem like they could care less. So many of these folks just live their lives as if God is dead. I mean, if they, if they really believed he was truly alive, wouldn't they act it, walk it, talk it? If God is not dead, why do church people act like he is and live like he is? So if God's not alive, why go to church and just go through the emotions? Another excuse people have given me, isn't God's word just a book? It, is God's word really true? I mean, do we really need to believe in this inspired quote unquote book? If God, if the word of God is truth, why don't Christians truly take it seriously? I mean, why don't Christians read it and why don't they meditate upon it and why don't they apply it to their lives? If God's word is a lie, then why do I need to go to church? And I hear a preacher preach out of a book of false statements and false promises and false hope. I'm concerned that if Christians don't take God's word as eternal and truthful and seriously, then my problem is, why do I go at church and sit there for an hour or so and listen to what we 
will never put into practice. Never take heed. I mean, how can a church say the Bible is the word of God, but they don't read it and practice it? It seems like from what I have observed and heard, fathers and mothers are hardly even caught by their children, even reading the Bible. They don't seem to act like the Bible is the truth and, and, and that they need to be taught it in their homes and to their children. They don't think that's important. If God's word is so important and, and it's the inspired word of God and it is the truth, then why are Christians not reading it? Why are they not into it? So many church members don't even open their Bible. They don't even know the books of the Bible. And they can't even tell you from the word of God how to be saved. They don't even know where to go to the Bible to find help and strength and hope. And so you say church is important because the Bible says don't forsake the assembly yourselves together. And yet we don't, as Christians, don't even read it. We don't meditate on it. We don't apply it to our lives on a daily basis. If we can't find truth in church, where do we go? And if the Bible is not true, what are we going to do? Thirdly, Hasn't the Holy Spirit lost her power? And I've heard people say that. If the Holy Spirit has power, where is she in the church? I mean, why don't we just see the work? Why don't we see the work of the Holy Spirit in our church? Why don't we see the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of Christians? I mean, when is the last time we saw a true Christian who has filled with love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and self-control? Has the Holy Spirit lost her power? Maybe it's me, but where is the Holy Spirit? I mean, why don't church folks get involved in worship? Why don't they make a joyful song? Why do they act like they're miserable? Why do they look so angry? And why do they look so upset? Why do they look so bitter? Why do they respond just like the world does to disagreements? There's no different how sometimes a Christian responds and the world responds. Where's the Holy Spirit's influence in a Christian's life? I have always heard about the moving of the Holy Spirit. Well, where is that movement? What happened to people being under conviction? And why don't Christians respond to an altar call when they, when you know they're in a situation, the preacher's preaching on that situation, they've talked to you about that situation, and yet when he gives an altar call about help for that situation, they sit there like a lump on the log. Why are the altars empty? And the entertainment places of the world, the sports places, the fitness centers, the restaurants and the shopping malls are full. People said they can't go to church, but they go to these places. If the Holy Spirit is so powerful, why don't we see the power of God in our church and the power of God in the life of church members and Christians? Why to go to church if there's no power? Now, some have given the excuse, hasn't God lost his power to forgive? I mean, have we come to a place where God no longer forgives sin? When was the last time that we heard in our church of God's forgiving someone, saving someone, calling a backslider back to him, or changing someone's life? If God is in the forgiving business, what happened to the church and why are they not responding to receiving that forgiveness and being forgivers themselves? Has God lost his power to forgive? Is getting God's forgiveness just a farce? Can God truly forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me from all my unrighteousness, my impurities, my evils, my sin? If that's so, then why don't we see it? And why don't we hear about it? Why don't we experience it? When's the last time someone talked or testified to the fact that God had forgiven them of all their sins? When's the last time someone or you heard someone testify or talk about that they were forgiven a particular sin and they got victory over that sin? And why don't we hear much preaching on the needing of forgiveness? And why don't we see church folks living as if they are forgiven? I mean, church folks are forgiven. Why don't we see a change in their life to the point they stand out as a lighthouse in the world? And why don't they live with joy and contentment? If God no longer forgives, why do I have to go to church and hear about forgiveness, but I never see it? And so I hear that many times. And then I hear the other, another excuse is, is, has God stopped answering prayer? We hear all the time about God answering prayer. And we hear sermons preached on God answering prayer. We're challenged to pray and fast. But I have a question. When was the last time we heard God answering a particular prayer in our church? When was the last time when God or when Christians went to the altar just to pray to God and wept over a lost soul or a lost loved one, a difficult situation or a broken relationship? Do we no longer think we need to pray? Has God stopped answering prayer? Are we in a place now that we no longer need to cry out to God because we got this? I'm concerned. I hear about prayer. But where's the evidence? It seems like church is more concerned about our financial program or not offending someone than they are about offending God. 
Are we at a place where church folks no longer ask God for help? They don't need him. We got all we need. I've got food in the refrigerator. I've got money in the bank. I've got a good job. I've got a nice home. I've got a healthy family. Why do I need to pray to God? You know, the, Jesus said that my house ought to be called a house of prayer. And when I look around the church where I'm going or where, wherever you may be going who's given this excuse, it seems like the church which ought to be called a house of prayer is a house of pleasure or house of play. It seems that we don't pray and fast, but we pray fast. When was the last time someone called on the church to pray for them? When was the last time the church, who's supposed to be a house of prayer and live lives of prayer, that prayer was a lifeline for them? When was the last time we heard and observed an altar of prayer? I mean, why, quit? why can't I quit church if God doesn't answer prayer? And then someone gave the excuse, well, God no longer lo loves, does he? He no longer extends his love. Where is God's love in this wicked world? Where is this God's love in this world of hatred and turmoil, and bitterness, and anger? We hear about the love of God, but does God truly love me? I've been around a lot of church folks, but I don't see love in their lives. If God loves me, why am I in this mess? I mean, why do good people suffer? Why do good people die of tragedies? I thought the preacher said God loves me. Then why don't I sense or feel that love? I mean... I am in a place I just want someone in the church to remind me they love me. When was the last time I heard someone in the church testify about the love of God and how it's changed their life? I'm truly hurting, and I need a hug. I know I've sinned and failed, but why don't church people, sh why do they always show me condemnation, but they don't show me compassion? Our world is in desperate need of love, and it seems to me that all, we see, all we're seeing is hatred and bitterness and division and strife and anger and brokenness. I'm concerned about hearing about God's love, but not seeing love manifested in the lives of Christians. If a sinner or backslider comes to church, and why don't they sense the love of God from church folks? Why do they feel condemned and not compassion? It's okay to quit church. I mean, if God no longer loves, if there's no love in the church, then the Bible's a farce and God is a farce. And then someone says, well, hasn't God stopped keeping his commandments or his promises? Now, I've heard it preached and thought over and over again, God has promised so many things. He promises salvation, sanctification, and glorification. And those are big words. Salvation means that coming to Jesus, accepting as our personal Savior, and he gives us forgiveness. Uh, sanctification is when we're growing, we're developing our Christian life, we're growing in our faith, and glorification is the day we get to go to heaven. I've read from the Bible so many promises, preacher, and, and why don't we see them fulfilled? I mean, to me, or is it true to me, is it true or is it no longer true that God's promises are reality or will become a reality? God in, God in his word promises grace and peace and love and joy. Why don't we see it fulfilled in the lives of Christians? What happened to all those promises given to us? I mean, if the Bible talks about promises, but we don't see the reality of them, then why do we even take the time to go to church or hear about the promises of God? Listen, look around us, and the church members seem like nothing is happening in their lives. The church sings songs about the promises of God, but don't sing them with enthusiasm. Whatever happened to live in our lives, believing God's promises are real, and, and so live in our lives as if we were stepping into the fulfillment of those promises. Come on now, why go to church if the promise is in the book that commands us to go is the same book with all the other promises and we don't see them fulfilled? We truly claim the promises of God. I mean, why don't we hear church people talk about certain promises in the Bible that they claimed and they, well, they, were been, they have been fulfilled in their lives? We should hear a lot about negativism in the church, don't we? And when are we going to hear something about certainties? God has promised us his love and his forgiveness, his protection and his grace, his mercy, his peace. When was the last time I heard someone testify about that in church? It's got to be okay to quit church when we hear about God's promises, but it seems like they are never fulfilled. And so I, there are seven of the excuses of why I can quit church. Will you allow me to respond to them briefly tonight? And there the excuse, isn't God dead? Well, God's not dead. He's alive and well on planet Earth. In fact, the Word of God tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. In Psalms 1846, 
the psalmist says, the Lord liveth, blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Revelation 1.18 says, I, I am he that is alive and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. God is alive today. He's as alive today as he was when he created the heavens and earth. The interesting thing about the Bible, it makes no arguments on the existence of God. Instead, the Bible just gives us the fact that God exists. For the very few words, in the beginning, God. That's how the Bible starts, with a, with a, with a statement, God. In fact, the biblical writers did not feel the need to offer any type of argument for the existence of God. To deny the existence of God, according to Psalms 14.1, the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But he said they are corrupt, and their deeds are vile, and there's no one that does good. A person who's vile and corrupt and has no good deeds will try to deny God to cover those wicked deeds. Well, you say, an excuse isn't God's word just a book. Well, God's word is truth. The Bible tells us in John 17, 17, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. John 14, 6 said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. The Bible is an extraordinary work of literature. It makes some of the most amazing claims. It records the details of the certainty of the universe and the creation of the universe and the origin of life and the moral law of God and the history of man's rebellion against God and literally the historical details of how God's work and uh, of redemption for all those who trust in him as their personal savior. The Bible claims to be God's revelation to mankind. If it's true, this implication has a lot of aspects of life in it. I mean, if the Bible is true, then it tells us how we should live and, and why we exist and what happens when we die and, and, and what our meaning and purpose is in life. But how do we know the claims of the Bible are true? The truth of the Bible is obvious to anyone who will really fairly investigate it. The Bible is self-consistent, it is authentic. It has changed millions of lives down through the years. It's been proven countless times by archaeologists and scientists. It possesses divine insight and, and into the nature of the universe, and it makes correct predictions about the future. And when Christians read the Bible, they cannot help but recognize the voice of the Creator. The Bible claims to be the Word of God, and it demonstrates this claim by making knowledge passable, uh, possible. Excuse me. The proof of the Bible is, is literally is that unless truth is presupposed, we can't prove anything at all. We've got to start with truth. In the beginning, God. Well, in the excuse, I can leave the church, quit the church, because the Holy Spirit has lost her power. Well, the Holy Spirit is powerful. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he talked to the church, he said, but he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, Paul told Timothy, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. In fact, the power of the Holy Spirit is the power of God. The Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, has appeared throughout the Word of God, throughout Scripture, as being through and by whom great works of power have been manifested. In fact, His power was first seen in the act of creation. For it was by His power the world came into existence, according to Genesis 1 and, and Job 26. The power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, convicts us. It teaches us. It equips us. It empowers the people of God to grow in grace and to spread the Word of God to a lost and dying world. The Spirit physical transform, physically transforms us and allows us to, for, for, to forsake our sins, it gives us the power to leave our sins and walk away from our sins and, and follow our eternal purpose that God has for us. The Holy Spirit, when one gets saved, changes someone's life. What a miracle that is. The Spirit puts to death our selfishness and replaces it with joy and love and peace. The Spirit literally prompts us, it nudges us, it convicts us of the way that God intends us to live. And when we get off the road, he nudges us back on the road. He pulls us, he woos us back into the road. The Spirit opens our eyes to things that break the heart of God and opportunities we have to be and express and have experience that gracious love. Well, your excuse is, has God lost his power to forgive? Well, God still is in the forgiving business. Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, 7, and 8, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. 
He tells us in Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us to the kingdom of, and, and literally conveyed us into the kingdom of God of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed. He forgave yesterday, he forgives today, and he will forgive till eternity comes to be in. He changes not. And since God created man and said that man was good, he has always wanted to have a relationship with man. And he ever has watched over humanity. God created Adam and Eve, created humanity for fellowship with him. And he placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know the story. It was a perfect place. And yet Adam and Eve disobeyed God and partook of the fruit that God said, don't do that. And through their disobedience, they sinned and brought sin into our world. So what does God do? Does he just totally forsake them? No, the Bible says he clothed them. And the Bible says that he forgave them. And, and, and literally, he created a sacrificial system in the Old Testament that they could seek forgiveness, but it always required a sacrifice. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and at once and for all. Jesus Christ provided a way for man to have forgiveness of their sins and, and have it to inherit heaven as their home. God calls on humanity to repent of their sins and accept the sacrifice. Jesus Christ became the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. And we can have the forgiveness of sin. Well, preacher, hasn't God just stopped answering prayer? I mean, God is still in the prayer answering business, isn't he? Yes, he is. The Bible tells us in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he leads us or heareth us. And if he knows that he hears us, and we know that he hears us, whoever and whatever we, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. John says in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, he shall ask what he will, and it shall be done unto thee. And we consider whether God is hearing us. The first and foremost important question, ladies and gentlemen, is do we have a personal relationship with him? And one of the prerequisites for hear, God hearing and answering prayer is that we are saved. Prayer is not getting or asking or even demanding. Prayer is, com is conversation between God and those who know him. And sometimes our prayers seem to go unanswered because God is keeping us for something better. Sometimes we ask what we really don't need. And God in his sovereignty knows if I give him that, this is what's going to happen. And it's going to be bad. So sometimes God answers yes, sometimes he answers no, and sometimes he answers wait. Probably the hardest ones of that is when God just says wait. So you really don't have a no answer, you don't have a yes answer, but you're just waiting. And the hardest thing in the world about waiting is it demands patience. And that might not be what we want to hear, but we only see part of the picture where God sees all the picture. God still answers prayer. Well, where's the love of God, preacher? Can't I quit church if God no longer loves? Well, the Bible informs us in John 3, 16, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a powerful verse about God's love. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves me and proved it and proved that statement by the cross. Jesus Christ went to a cross, not because of anything we have done, but because of his unconditional love for us. God does not just say he loves us. God demonstrates his love for us by stretching out his arm and arms and going to a cruel, rugged cross for our sins and paying the price for our sins and paying the price and taking our judgment that God was going to throw upon all those who sinned. And the to he took the total pen penalty for our sins. God loves us so much he ever watches over us. God loves us so much his eye is upon us. God loves us so much that in when we're yet sinners, God tries to woo us to him. You see, his love for us is always available. And the evidence of God's love is in the Christian life is joy. I'm telling you, one of the evidence you know you love and God loves you is there's an inner peace and an inner joy and an inner contentment that you know God's got this. The demonstration of the love of God begins to come in our life. And when we get it in our life, you know how it overflows in the lives of others. Number seven, you know, I think I can quit church, preacher, and hasn't God stopped keeping his promises? Well, the answer to that is, no, God's, the, God, the God is a God of his word. He cannot lie. In fact, the Bible tells us in John 14, 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Numbers 23, verse 19, powerful verse. It said, God is not a man that he should lie, neither son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken and shall not make it good? God always keeps his promises. But we must understand several things. Now, some of the promises in the Bible are for specific people at a specific time. They're not for us. For example, God gave some specific promises to the children of Israel. God gave some specific promises to the prophets and to individuals in the Old Testament and in the New. There are not promises for us. There are promises for them. So those promises have already been fulfilled, but they were fulfilled in a particular time for a particular people and for a particular purpose. Though some promises are unconditional. Uh, those are promises that God loves us unconditionally. Otherwise, my life does not depend on whether or not God loves me. God doesn't love me because I'm such a good-looking fella, even though that's true. God doesn't love me because I'm so smart. God doesn't love me because anything I've done, God loves me, period, period, and it has nothing to do what I've ever done, said, or could do. He loves me, period. But some promises are conditional. You see, salvation is a wonderful gift of God. However, the only way that we can get salvation the condition of that salvation is that we must turn to him. We must believe on him. We must accept him. We must confess our sins. And there's so many promises in the book that are ours, but there's conditions to them. There's prerequisites to them. Every promise in the book is fulfilled or being fulfilled or we will be fulfilled. The word of God is written truths and written promises from God. And they counted on them in the Old Testament. And guess what? They came to pass. They counted on them in the New Testament. Guess what? They came to pass. And we can count on them today, and they are coming to pass. And we can count on them in the future, because they will come to pass. It was Charles Spurgeon that said, The promises of God are to the believer an inexhaustible mine of wealth. Happy is it for him if he knows how to search out their secrets, the secret veins, and enrich himself with those hidden treasures. He said that they are an armory, armory uh, containing all manner of offensive and defensive weapons, Blessed is he who has learned to enter into the sacred arsenal and put on the breastplate and the helmet and lay his hand on the sword and the spear. They are like a pharmacy in which the believer will find all manner of restoration and blessed elixir. Blessed is he who said who is well skilled in heavenly pharmacy and knows how to lay hold on the healing virtues of the promises of God. When I was growing up, my mom had a saying to us, and it was always this, and I'll never forget it. When we talk about excuses, and everybody throws out an excuse once in a while, but she said this, and I'll never forget it. And you've probably heard it. An excuse is a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. You see, an excuse is getting our eyes off the promises of God, his truths, and finding reasons not to believe them. We can give all kinds of excuses about quitting church, folks. But an excuse is an attempt to lessen the blame, attaching to a fault or offense, trying to seek a defense to justify ourselves. It's trying to pull someone else down so that we can lift ourselves up. We always have an excuse by comparing ourselves with someone else. And God said, listen to me, the person you must compare yourself to is Jesus Christ. An excuse is to release someone from a duty or requirement. So what happens, we make excuses. We're saying, I don't need to go to church. Therefore, I don't have to obey the Bible. When the Bible says, come. I don't have to do this because, because I, 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 I. Reason or ex it's a reason or explanation to put forward to defend or justify one's own fault or offense. It's to make a defense or a reason or explanation. You know, whenever someone does something wrong, they always have an excuse. They always want to blame something or someone else. Let me tell you, all those excuses are going to be vain and void when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. How many people do we know that are always making excuses, but their excuses are not back with truth? They'll tell you the reason why they don't go to church is this. Show me in the Bible, that's okay. The reason why I can't come is this. Show me in the Bible, it's okay. Well, you don't understand. Listen, I don't need to understand. You need to understand what God says and be obedient to God. We can make an excuse not to do and not to believe or, or, or do anything, but that doesn't make it right. See, God has commanded us in Hebrews eleven twenty five: don't forsake yourselves to assemble yourselves together as the manner of some is. So some were not going to church. We should have been going to church. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as he see that day approaching. What he's saying here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 25, 
is God wants us to come together because we need each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to build each other up. We need each other. God built us to have fellowship. And we have to understand in order to have fellowship, we've got to be together. And the more we stay apart, the less fellowship we have and the less power we're going to understand. We're going to lose some power. And the next thing you know, the longer you stay out of church, the more reasons you're going to have not to come back. And it's harder to come back. We can make excuses, but that does not excuse us. And so tonight I just shared some things with you from my heart. People are always talking about all these excuses. Why they don't have to come to church. Why they're going to quit church. I gave you seven of them. They'll tell you that God is dead. They'll tell you that the, the, book, the word of God is not the truth. They'll tell you that the Holy Spirit has lost his power. They'll tell you that God no longer forgives. And they'll tell you that God is no longer answering prayer. They'll tell you that, the, that God no longer loves us. And they'll tell you that God has stopped keeping his promises. I'm here to tell you all those excuses are nothing but lies. The truth is, God loves you. God cares for you. God wants the best for you. God's got a purpose for you. God's got a plan for you. And the greatest joy you'll ever have is in fulfilling what God has in store for you because God knows all things past, present, and future. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, tonight I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, that it's so easy to, 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 to follow you if we'll just trust you. So many times we have all these excuses, but they're not going to excuse us on the last day. So I pray tonight that whatever we're throwing out there to make excuses why we're not following the Lord, trusting the Lord, obeying the Lord, being in church, that we'll wake up and understand that's not God's way, that's our way. And our way will always get us in trouble. Help us realize we need each other. We need your word to be preached to us and taught us. We need a wonderful fellowship with the brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to know that there are other people struggling with the same things we're struggling with, and yet they're getting victory through faith. Lord, tonight I pray that there may be someone out there that does not know you as a personal Savior. I ask, Lord, that you'll speak to that heart. And Lord, they may be going through some terrible situations right now. I pray that you draw them to you. And I thank you for your precious word that's so truthful and honest that gives us so many wonderful promises. Help us, Lord, to trust you because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.